Thank you guys very much. You may be seated. Wonderful to have all of you here. Special welcome if you're a guest. Hope you'll come back, be with us. Uh, love having guests here at Grace at the uh, early service. Thanks for being here. Most of us in this room are acquainted with what's called the serenity prayer. Remember the serenity prayer. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I thought some of you might like uh, to learn the new serenity prayer. Anybody acquainted with the new serenity prayer? It goes like this. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to hide the dead bodies of people who wrong me. <laughs> the new serenity prayer. The wisdom to hide the dead bodies of people who wrong me. Anybody ever wronged you? You don't have to live long on planet Earth before somebody wrongs you. Now, ironically... We often end up being wronged by the people closest to us. Isn't that interesting? Very often, the people who wrong us are actually members of our very own family. Boy, family, there's something. <laughs> Anybody got a family? Someone has compared a family to a pack of porcupines on a cold winter's night. When they move apart, they get cold. And when they move together, they stick each other. Does that sound like your family? If you're a part of a family, chances are you have been stuck a few times. For some of you, and let's just be honest, just mentioning the word family does not bring warm fuzzies. In fact, mentioning the word family brings up feelings of deep hurt and of anger and some of you, serious pain, serious emotional pain. Why? Because my experience is there is no hurt like the hurt of being wronged by a family member. Well, welcome back to Wise Guys. Uh, this summer, we are looking at some of the lives of Old Testament characters who uh, were not perfect in any way at all. They're just like us, uh, normal people. But they demonstrated great wisdom in a specific area of their life. And, and so we're looking at these guys each week. Today we had the opportunity to learn an outstanding, outstanding lesson from a wise guy by the name of Joseph. Now toward the end of his life, Joseph teaches us one of the great wisdom lessons of all time. And here it is. Learn how to forgive family members who have wronged you. That is a great lesson. Now, if you think for one moment what we're going to talk about today is easy, you better get a life. What we're talking about today will be one of the greatest challenges you face as a believer in Jesus Christ. Learning to forgive those family members who have wronged you. But now guys, if we don't learn to forgive family members who have wronged us, guess who's going to suffer? We are. It's not going to be them. You know, this is the old, hey, I'll teach you, and you shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah, I'll teach you, and it's the old, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get even with you. I'm going to stay awake all night and wrestle and not get sleep and get ulcers. And See, forgiveness works. Unforgiveness, that's not easy. What we're talking about today is a great challenge, but it is well worth learning the lesson of Joseph. Now, if you are here today and you're thinking, well, Rick, you just don't know. You don't know my family member. You don't know how ugly they have been. You don't know how they have wronged me. Nobody in the history of the universe has been wronged at the level that I've been hurt then you are ready to hear the story of Joseph. If you have ever been hurt or wronged, especially by family members, let Jesus, let, excuse me, let Joseph teach you today how to demonstrate what we're going to call today a wise forgiveness. What does it take to demonstrate a wise forgiveness? All right, here's the backstory, just so everybody's on the same page. 
Here's the backstory of Joseph's life. Remember, he is sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. All right, just quick show of hands. I know some of you have been hurt by family members. Anybody here been sold into slavery by a family member? Any? Show of hands. Yeah, I'm telling you, this is pretty bad. I mean, how bad, how, how much worse can it be? Well, actually, some of the brothers wanted to kill him. And one of the brothers said, no, let's don't kill him. Let's be nice. Let's sell him into slavery. Thanks a lot. So he's sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. Now, he ends up in Egypt where he, by an unbelievable set of circumstances, rises to become second in command of the entire land of Egypt. Now, when a famine hits the land, Joseph's brothers have to travel to Egypt to buy food. What they don't know is that their long-lost brother Joseph is the guy in charge of food distribution. Houston, we got a problem. When Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers, they fear for their lives. They're going, "Uh uh-oh, it is going to come back to bite us now. We are dead meat. Surprise, surprise. Instead of getting revenge, Joseph extends forgiveness. You ready for this? He extends forgiveness to his undeserving brothers. Now, Joseph teaches us in this, in this story what true forgiveness is. It has nothing to do with your feelings, okay? Well, I just don't feel like for No. No, here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is giving up the right to get even. Okay, you got that? It has nothing to do with how you feel about the person. It is making a wise decision that I'm gonna, I've got every right to get even. Forgiveness is giving up the right to get even. Now, the story of Joseph and his brothers is one of the greatest stories in all the Bible on the topic of forgiveness. But it illustrates a passage of Scripture that I think I put in your notes, Ecclesiastes 10, 12. Let's say this together. It's on the screen. Ready? The words of a wise man are gracious. Did you get that? The words, you want to be a wise person? You want to be a wise guy? Then then learn to be gracious. Learn to extend grace and extend forgiveness. So from the example of Joseph today, let's learn how to extend a wise forgiveness. What does it take? Two big challenges, guys. Number one, never forget God's sovereignty. Never forget God's sovereignty. Now, Joseph learns this back in Genesis chapter 45. Let me read you the story. And here, this is where Joseph's brothers come to get food, and, and they don't know who Joseph is yet. He's kind of kept his identity secret, but now, now the big reveal. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him. Oh, you think? (laughs) Yeah, because they were, what, mildly afraid? A little concerned? Look at the word. They were terrified. At his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, There has been famine in the land, 
And for the next five years, there will be no plowing or re and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. All right. Did anybody pick up on the recurring theme of Joseph's comments to his brothers? He said it three times. God sent me. God sent me. It wasn't you. You thought it was you, and in, at one level it was you, and what you did was wrong, and what you did was evil, but at a higher level, viewed from the sovereignty of God, it was in reality God. God sending me to Egypt. God was working in your evil deeds that you meant to destroy. God used those events to bring about salvation and to bring about deliverance for people. What happened here? Joseph was able, now follow this, Joseph was able to forgive his brothers because he recognized the sovereign hand of God working behind the scenes to bring all this together. Now, have, have you been able to see the sovereign hand of God at work in your life? How about that? Uh, hey, even the stuff that's unfair, even the stuff that's unjust and painful, how many of you really believe Romans 8.28? Romans 8.28, let's read it. Let's see, okay? You ready? Listen carefully. And we know that in... In what? Some things. Most things. The things I can figure out. No, no. For we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God works in all things for our good. He works in bad things, evil things, unjust things, unfair things. When family members wrong us, God can actually work in that bad situation. What it isn't good, but God can bring good out of a bad situation. God has the amazing ability to pull this off. So let's get our first principle down in our notes. We will never discover the art of forgiveness until we discover the sovereignty of God. You can't do it. You see, trusting God's sovereignty will liberate you from the prison of unforgiveness and bitterness. Here, here's what happens, guys. When you, when you start getting the big picture, really trusting God's sovereignty in your life, it, it allows you to spend less time plotting revenge and more time watching God create something good out of the bad stuff in our lives. Absolutely amazing. If you begin to look at things through God's perspective, looking at the sovereignty of God, you'll stop saying, well, why did this happen to me? And you'll start saying, I wonder why this happened to me. Hear the difference in the tone? I wonder how God's going to use this. How is God going to work? How's God going to grow me and mature me? How's he going to develop character in me? through this difficult time. Yeah, you know, I've told you guys before that several years ago I made a major philosophical change between my ears. I, I used to think of life as a roller coaster. Uh, you know, a roller coaster it, with its ups and downs. And so life was, you, there were good times and then there were bad times. And there were good times and bad times. But now I really see life illustrated more like railroad tracks. Now think about this. Running parallel to railroad tracks, life at any given moment has both good and bad happening at the same time. Frankly, seldom, if ever, do we experience one or the other, all good or all bad. Now think about your own life. Life is one constant journey with good and bad happening at the same time. Now, we don't have time to do open mic this morning, but I want you to think right now, in your life, right now, this day, can anybody think of something good happening in their life? 
Can anybody think of something bad also happening today in your life? Isn't it amazing? Life is not a roller coaster. It's railroad tracks. It's parallel lines. Now, let me illustrate this in the life of Joseph. Just think of all the good, bad railroad tracks in Joseph's life. All right, first, Joseph is a slave in Potiphar's house. Bad. But he rises to a position of authority and influence. Good. He is trusted by his boss. That's good. But he is seduced by his boss's wife. That's bad. He refuses her seduction. That is good. But he is falsely accused. That's bad. He lands in prison. That's bad. But he rises to a position of authority and influence. Well, that's good. He is able to interpret his cellmate's dreams. That's good. But then he is forgotten by the cupbearer. That's bad. And it goes on. Because life is not a roller coaster. Life is parallel railroad tracks. Good and bad are happening in your life all the time. All right, um, now let me read to you a parable. The, the title of this parable is, Is it good or is it bad? There was once a man who lived in a small cottage with his wife and son. Their prized possession was a gorgeous Arabian mare. His neighbors told him how lucky he was to own such a beautiful mare. He said he didn't know if it was good or bad. He just knew that he owned a beautiful mare. Well, one night, the beautiful mare broke out of the corral and ran away. His neighbor said, what bad luck. But the man said he didn't know if it was good or bad. All he knew was that his mare was gone. The very next day, his mare returned with seven beautiful Arabian stallions following. All the neighbors told him how lucky he was. But he said he didn't know if it was good or bad. He just knew he got his mare back with seven beautiful stallions. Now the man's son decided to break one of the stallions, but he was thrown and he broke his leg. The neighbors told the man what bad luck for this to happen to his son. But the man said he didn't know if it was good or bad. All he knew was that his son broke his leg. Now about that time in the land, the king sent his men and enlisted all the able-bodied men to join the army and go to war. However, they didn't take the man's son because of the son's broken leg. Now, the neighbors told the man how lucky he was that his son didn't have to go to war because he had a broken leg. But the man said he didn't know if it was good or bad. He just knew that his son had a broken leg and couldn't go to war. The end. So let me ask you, what you're going through right now, is it good or is it bad? Now don't answer too quick. Because you have to realize that when your life is in God's hands, he can bring something good out of something bad. He will work in all things to bring about something good. Good. Now, what does this have to do with forgiveness? Once you have the perspective of the sovereignty of God, and that's controlling your life and your mind and the way you think and your perspective and the way you look at people who have wronged you, it puts it all in a new perspective. Suddenly you realize God can bring something good if I allow him. Joseph was able to forgive his brothers because he believed in the sovereignty of God. Wise guys can forgive, even us, if we never forget God's sovereignty. Okay, you got that one? God's sovereignty. There's something else, number two. Never forget God's goodness. Never forget God's goodness. Now for this, we've got to go to Genesis 50. Genesis 50. This is at the very end of the story. Let me read it to you. 
When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, okay, you see what's going on? Okay, the whole family came to Egypt, they're, they're taken care of, but then daddy dies, uh-oh, we got another problem, Houston, daddy died. Now what's Joseph going to do? When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, now, what, listen to them cook up this big lie. All right, what, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, uh, your, your father left these instructions before he died. Now, guys, they're making this up as they go. You got that? Okay. He made these instructions before he died. Here's his instructions, verse 17. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. And the brothers say, now please forgive the sins of your servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. Just It broke his heart. His brothers then came, now watch, threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he, and he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. All right. How could Joseph continue to extend forgiveness to his guilt-ridden lying brothers? All right, can we all agree in this room? It's one thing to forgive somebody one time. But then when they come and they, here they lie, I mean, they make up, they cook up this lie about, oh, daddy said this, and you know, you know, it, it's, it's like Joseph could have easily said, all right, you knuckleheads, I forgave you back then. You cook up this lie about my dad who just died, you, you're a bunch of idiots. I'm not about to forgive you again. All right, here's the key. See, not only how do you forgive, but how do you keep forgiving? By the way, has anybody figured out that some of your relatives aren't getting better? Age isn't helping. They're still as dysfunctional today as they were 10 years ago. They may still be wronging you. That's why forgiveness is not a one act. It's a whole play. It just kind of keeps going. It's a lifestyle. How could Joseph continue to extend forgiveness to his guilt-ridden lying brothers? Answer, Joseph could do it because he had experienced the goodness of God in his own life. That's it. Joseph was able to see the big picture of his life and how God had been good to him over the years. All right, so in your notes, let's get our next big principle. If you see God as a mean and unforgiving God, you will have trouble forgiving people who have wronged you. Do you understand that your view of God affects how you treat other people? If you think God is mean and unforgiving in your life, you're going to turn and you're going to treat other people that same way. You with me? Remember Jesus says, here's the greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know one of the problems with planet Earth? We've been doing that second one. We're, we, we're loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. We don't love ourselves very well. Guess how we love our neighbor? Not very well. We don't think God can forgive us. We love our neighbor in the same way. We don't forgive them. Well, we don't think God could ever, ever forgive our sin and, and ride our lives. And so we look at our family members who have wronged us, and guess what we do? We project that same thing to them. No, that's not the answer. Let me give you a, a great example, a biblical example of what I'm talking about. The Apostle Paul, a wonderful example of this very truth. Let me tell you a little story about Paul. At the very end of Paul's life, he's locked up in a Roman prison, and he writes 2 Timothy. 
Most scholars believe that 2 Timothy, his last book, the last letter that he wrote, was probably written a few weeks before he was beheaded as a martyr of Jesus Christ. So we're at the very end of Paul's life. He's locked up in prison. He has gone through his trials, like, you know, before a judge. Um, Things are not going well, okay? Handwriting is on the wall so heavy, the wall's about to fall down. He's at the end of his life. At the very end, Paul is wronged by people who have should, should have been his greatest supporters. Okay, you got, you got the picture? They should have been his greatest supporters, and they became his greatest deserters. They, they tucked tail and ran because they were chicken. Now, how is Paul going to respond? 2 Timothy 4, 14. Watch this. Alexander, the metal worker, did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. Now watch verse 16. At my first defense, he's talking about his trial. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May they all burn in hell. Oh, wait, did I misquote that verse? May it what? Let's say it out loud. Not be held against them. You know what you call that? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Unbelievable. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, all alone at the end of his life, after all he's done for God, you would think at this point Paul would shake his fist at God. No. Read on, verse 17. But the Lord stood at my side. You know what you call that? Sovereignty of God. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. You know what you call that? God works in all things for good. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack. Now watch. And will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. He knows he's about to die. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what impresses me about Paul here? He's not bitter at God. He's not bitter at people. How do you get to that point? Instead of getting bitter and seeking revenge, he just turns his critics over to God. Lord will take care of them. And then flat out offers those jerks forgiveness. Now, here's the question. How was Paul able to get to that point at the end of his life? All right, hit the rewind button and let's go back a few years. How was Paul able to get there? Because he never forgot how good God had been to him. Paul never forgot how much God had forgiven him when he was undeserving. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. This is what guided Paul. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Now here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. (laughs) Paul raises his hand, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him, that's us, and receive eternal life. What's the next big lesson we need to learn? Let's get it in our notes. We cannot give away what we do not possess. 
We cannot truly give forgiveness to others until we first accept God's forgiveness for ourselves. Guys, you can't give away what you don't have. So you have to receive God's forgiveness, realize you didn't deserve it. That just kind of inspires you to forgive all those family members who have wronged you. 1 John 4. Here it is in a nutshell. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, now watch, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Will you allow me to insert the word forgiveness there? Since God forgave us, we also must forgive others. That's the way it works. Joseph was able to forgive his brothers because he never forgot something. He never forgot the goodness of God in his own life. You want to be wise? Wise guys can forgive because they never forget God's amazing goodness in their own lives. So, here's my question. Was Solomon right? Remember we started with Solomon's quote? The words of a wise man are gracious. You see, Joseph was clearly a wise guy because he spoke gracious words of forgiveness to the very brothers who had wronged him. He discovered, ladies and gentlemen, the true meaning of forgiveness. It's giving up the right to get even. So, let's talk. Who's willing? Who's, will, who's willing to give up the right to get even? I didn't say who's feeling the right. <laughs> now, if you wait around for your feeling, Jesus will beat you back. Who's willing to forgive? Who's willing to say, I'm willing that that person in my life, maybe it's a boss, maybe it's that family member like Joseph, are you willing to say, okay, I will make a decision today to be a wise guy. I will make a decision today. They, don't, they didn't earn it. They don't deserve it. Chances are they'll do it again. But as of today, I'm deciding to give up the right to get even. Boy, for some of you, that's going to be a huge weight that's about to fall off your shoulders. You're going to be able to walk upright before the Lord knowing that you're not carrying that bitterness and that anger and you're not looking for that opportunity to give them the knife. Are you willing to forgive? It can happen. It really can happen if you will remember and never forget God's sovereignty and God's goodness. You follow Joseph's example. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe someday even you could be a wise guy. How about let's pray? Well, Father, uh, anytime you address the issue of forgiveness in our lives, things get quiet in the room. And Lord, that's because Everybody here has been wronged. Many of us in this room have been wronged by people closest to us, even family members. So I pray, God, that uh, you would empower us with your Holy Spirit. Would you, would you fill us with a divine level of love and grace and forgiveness so that we would truly be able to forgive people who haven't earned it, haven't deserved it, and never will. But God, you have been so gracious to us. May we simply pay it forward and walk in the wonderful place called forgiveness. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.